You're inside the Thriller Zone with Philip Fricasse, episode 108. Hello, and welcome to the Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. As I mentioned earlier in the year, we're going to broaden our reach of thrillers. Does that mean we're going to bring in the elements of horror? <laughs> sure. This gentleman is the author of the story collection Beneath a Pale Sky, which was a finalist for the Bram Stoker Award. His short stories have been published in a number of magazines, including Best Horror of the Year, Nightmare Magazine, Black Static, Dark Discoveries, and Cemetery Dance, to name a few. Our guest is the first thriller writer to help expand, as we say, our repertoire to include horror thrillers. Philip Fracassi is the author of A Child Alone with Strangers, and this book is something else. And as you'll see, we'll talk about it. It's a big read. Please welcome Philip Fricasi on the Thriller Zone. Look at look at the background I got going for you. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, does it look familiar by any chance? Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah. Is it Fricasi or Fricasi? It's 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 Fricasi. Okay. You were fr- super close on the second variation. <laughs> I'm just look. Sometimes people throw in like a- random ends. Like uh-huh. oh, so Mr. Frankowski. I'm like, where? There's no N. <laughs> where are you getting the N? Like it's not even. I get like the other stuff, but there's no there's no end there. <laughs> I've been called Francisky. I'm like I don't. Are you looking at the? Are you looking at the <laughs> letters? Are you even trying? You know. Hey, so you're down by Encinitas, huh? Hey, uh, one mile, one point one miles from exactly where you're going to be on the tenth, which we're going to oh. bring up. Oh, great. Okay, cool. I'm not the most PC writer in the world, unfortunately, for me. Um, can I just say, thank God that you're not. Well, what's funny is, so I wrote this book called Gothic right. and it's coming out in February. And literally mm-hmm. the whole book is about an author who's out, who's an older author and who's not, you know, hip to the new sensitivities of society yeah. and people are, and like, it's a joke running gag throughout that he's not that he's not sensitive over, you know, PC sensitive guy and people like continue to write nasty reviews about him not being PC sensitive guy. I'm like, no, that's the whole point is that's his character <laughs> <laughs> that he's, that he's not. And they don't, they don't, they don't get the, They don't get it. They don't get it. Oh. They don't get it. I'm on a show. I'm just, I'm getting my, I'm getting a prop. So that's the book. That's the Gothic. Yeah. It's a good looking cover, dude. It's, you know, it's like a horror cover, right? I mean, it's, that's the idea. Right. Like, like this is like very more, this is much more of a mainstream story. So I wanted yeah. more of a mainstream cover. This yeah. is a, this is a horror novel and I didn't want people misguided. God forbid people are surprised anymore. Caught up. Philip, God yeah. forgive, for, God forbid we'd be misguided. I know. You have taken me down a trail. I didn't even want to go, mister. I would have put trigger warnings in this book, except it would have taken too many pages. It would have been the first 30 pages would have been trigger warnings. And then the re- so I'm hoping this is like enough. Like if you pick this up and read it and you're still offended, then you've, then you've known to blame by yourself. This is yeah. Not- hold that really close to the camera. I want to see the, yeah, yeah. that this is, is not, this is not a, Oh, I hope this book is an offensive thing. This is, <laughs> this book is good. So, so you know how you're scribbling people's books. So my, my tagline sure. for this one is, this book will offend you. I just kind of do like a general blanket trigger warning for all of my books that if something that you read offends you to the point where you feel like you need to go online and talk about it, then you shouldn't just 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 take just take my books out of the equation, and that way everybody's happy. You know, I'm I'm an old I'm an old guy. I don't get it. You know, I don't. I'm, back in my day. Tell me about that, Philip. What was happening back in your day? In my day, we'd stay up and watch, you know, Friday the 13th when we were seven years old. And it was just, everything was hunky-dory. No problemo. Sure. When I was, I saw Jaws, like I saw Jaws at seven. So I don't like, and I was like, that's fine. I got no yeah. problem with that. I didn't like it's, going in the water. It's a shark. Or, it's a shark. Yeah. Like I remember when the head rolled out of the boat. Yeah. You know that when he when Richard Dreyfus uh-huh. is underwater, uh-huh. and I was like, "Whoa!" You know what I saw when I was young that really messed me up. Talk about trigger warnings! Is uh, Watership Down? You ever see the cartoon, The Rabbits, based on the Richard mm-hmm. Adams book? 
Mm, no, I apologize. Uh, it's not coming up to my. It's about brain. these rabbits. It's a cartoon. So my mom took us to see this cartoon about <laughs> rabbits, thinking like this is going to be, like what <laughs> could possibly go wrong. Right. And it's the bloodiest, most depressing, most savage. Like it's like a cartoon you could ever see. Like it's rabbits ripping each other apart, like blood splashing across the screen. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's a, but it's that, that scarred me for sure. That scarred yeah. me for sure as a youngster. I think the only thing that scarred me and uh, my dad was a preacher. So you can imagine I'm teeing you up right now. So when we saw, when the exorcist came on yeah, and the family was scurried from the room and locked in our bedrooms, you will not be watching that. Yeah. I would not uh, want to. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah well, I was going to say, if you know anything about PKs, then you know what's the number one thing we live by. You tell me not to do it, then I've got to do it. Yeah, that was the big mistake with that movie. Is it became, you know, that that thing that that taboo thing when you were yeah. a kid, that taboo movie. I mean, I was raised in a pretty you know religious household, and I remember like the Terminator was you know from the devil. So. Exorcist wasn't even like on the playing board. Like it wasn't even like that was, I, I saw it when I was, I actually saw it when, cause you know, it was like everybody, all the kids were running around like, uh, you know, like doing the, and pre, you know, pretending to vomit the pea green soup. Right. <laughs> I mean, that was, if that was a, that was part of growing up and I, sure. and I didn't know what they were talking about, but I was like, Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. What is it? What are you doing? And, um, and I married, I eventually saw it at a, at like a friend's house, of course. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I was like, I, I wasn't, I was just like, I don't, I remember not being like, um, I remember not getting it. I remember being like, I don't really understand. I think I was, you know, I was very young. I was like six or whatever. So I think I was like, I don't, I don't get it. But Jaws, yeah. I got Jaws. I definitely got sure. it. I got it. I was scared. I loved it. I'll tell you, can I, can I tell you the scare that, cause I'll tell you that my, I was think recently I was thinking about, Somebody asked me a few a few weeks ago, they said, what was the moment that you think turned you into a horror writer or a lover of horror? And and I had to – they're like, not nah, don't say Stephen King when you're reading Stephen King. What was the – what was the thing, the one moment? And I, had to, and I was like, no, that's interesting. Let me really think about it. And so I kind of thought about it, and I realized there was a moment, which was – I don't know. I have no idea how old I was. I was a little kid, and we used to watch um, – Creature features on Saturday afternoons. Sure. Um, I grew up outside Detroit, so I don't know where what, we like Sir Gosley Graves and the Ghoul and all these like cool guys who hosted uh, Elvira and all that stuff. So anyway, um, at the end of the movie, the original The Fly. Oh okay? yeah, because the whole movie it's the big he's got the big fly head on and he's wearing like a nice suit. Yeah, and he's kind of like and he just kind of walks up to people and they're like ah. You know, because he's a big business and his mouth is, I think, maybe. Um, I mean, that might just be in my head. But um, but then at the end of the movie, he goes back into the machine to reverse it. And instead of, and she's like, the love interest is like, where'd he go? Where'd he go? And then you hear that little like squeaky, help me, help me. <laughs> right. And she sees him and she's, he's stuck in the spider web. And now his head is a human head. And he's in the body of a fly and the spider's like crawling toward him. And he's like, no, and then he eats him. And I was like, I think that was the moment. I was like, what? And awesome. Like it was that combination of like mind blown and also like in a really good way. I'm also yeah. totally on board. I think that was the moment. I'm going to tell you right up front. I'm going to take that little clip and I'm going to use that as a new sound bite. Help me. Help me. Yeah, and then she's like, she can't watch. She's like, oh, Charles, or whatever. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, roll credits, man. That's it. Yeah. Roll eaten by a giant spider in fly body form. I used to wish they had one of those fly heads I could wear as like a Halloween costume, but I've never seen one, or at least not a good one. That is a great point. And how in the world can that not have happened unless right? Jeff Goldblum has the market share on that? I don't know. He might have a patent. I don't know. Um, and then I saw, of course, Cronenberg's The Fly, and it was a whole different oh, level yeah. of horror. That was a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece, but I watched, Cronen it, re yeah. Yeah. I watched it recently. It's amazing. Cronenberg has a an imagination like nobody else on the planet. 
Yeah, I haven't seen his new movie, Crimes of the Future, but I've heard it's great, and I want to see it. And his son, I'm, I think it's, a, I'm assuming it's his son, did uh, made a movie recently that I can't remember the name of, but it came out last year, and it was pretty disturbing. It was really good. I can't remember. Oh. <laughs> I can remember neither the son's name nor the name of the film, but it's something Cronenberg. I can tell you that. That's always good when you go, man. It was disturbing. I don't remember the name of it. Though. Yeah, it I don't remember bad. who was in it. No. I hope you, I hope everyone watches. It. I mean, it was good. It was it was, but it was it was intense. I can't yeah. remember. What's the one that he did where there were dual uh, twin brothers? Oh, with Jeffrey Irons. Yes, yeah. Jeremy Irons. Jer- sorry, Jeremy Irons. Yeah, I saw yeah. that too, and I, I saw it in the theater. I uh, I don't remember the name wow. of the mo- body. I was going to say Body mm. Devil, but that's a different movie. That's a Brian De Palma movie. Yeah, it's De Palma. Uh, yeah, which is an excellent film also. Yes. Um, except I knew it was The Indian. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I knew it was The Indian. Was. Um, I, but I, identity something, double identity, double, body double, but something. I don't know. But that's no. a, that was a pretty creepy movie. I that remember, was super creepy. I remember as a kid seeing that, as a teenager probably at that point, and I don't remember being scared. I remember thinking like, this is really, really weird. I think I think that's you appreciate Cronenberg more as you get older. I think. Well, yeah, you get to the point where you go, uh, you realize, okay, now he has uh, he's traveling in a in an atmosphere that I'm not sure that many people do or yeah. should. Remember Scanners? Yeah, was that Cronenberg? Oh. Yeah, was know. that David Cronenberg? I remember that's where the yes, heads explode, yes. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. One of my favorite. When that head exploded, I was like, "Oh, I am so all in now." Yeah, and the whole like they do the whole like. Oh, <laughs> and then I've the got it. Yeah. Dead ringers. Dead ringers. Yeah, which is a weird, yeah, name. Yeah, and Can I remember there did... was like they did surgery on each other. It was really that was a weird. Movie. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, hey, I ladies did... and gentlemen. Yeah, by the way, I need to probably say for the record, welcome to Philip. I want to make sure fracassi correct to the okay. thriller zone and this yeah. right here by the way i uh i canceled my gym membership so that i could it's just thick. so i could just yeah. basically do bench presses with this it's thick it's a brick yeah it's a big book it's uh it's friggin delicious we're going to talk about it by the way you want to know who turned me on to this yeah uh, the guy who wrote your blurb on the cover, J. Todd Scott. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Todd. Yeah. We were, we were talking on the show and I said, Todd, what are you reading in your downtime? <clears throat> this is before I'm, uh, when you're not, ready. when you're not keeping the world safe from drug criminals, by the way, He's <laughs> when you're not doing that, Mr. DEA, what right. do you read? He goes, right. what horror are this- you reading? Yeah, there's this guy for Kasi. You got to read his stuff. I'm like, really? Well, tell me. Well, he's got this book coming up, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay. And I started digging down. And I think within seconds, I'm like banging on your door. Hey, dude, you don't know me. And I do a thriller podcast, but come play. Yeah. Todd's great. Yeah, Todd was – it's weird because I used to – Todd – I have like, okay, so I have a shelf of Todd's books. Like I have all – like at first printing – I'm a fan. And then I think one random day on Twitter, he – he 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 i don't know he like he mentioned me he mentioned my book of short stories i think and i was like dude i'm such a i'm a huge fan of yours this is such an honor that you would even know who i am and he was like i'm a huge fan and i was like what and he was like what and then we became friends so um and now we're actually we're actually doing an event together uh i'll I'll be at virtual um on december 7th we're going to do a co virtual thing for the poisoned pen bookstore um nice yeah yeah cool Tiny little bookstore nobody knows about. Right. I'm kidding. Only one of the biggest in the world. But let me just read his blurb on the front, folks, because you probably can't read it from where you're sitting. A tour de force, equal parts Stephen King and Laird Barron and worth every sleepless night. That is a way – that is really good, but I've got one better. I was going to start off by saying, Philip, it's silly good, but I realize that you have been – you are now the introduction to my audience. We're a hundred and – five, six, uh, let's see, you'll be 107 episodes, right? And we're now bre- branching out into horror thrillers and you're the number one first guy. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's a, <clears throat> I mean, they really my a lot of my, you know, I, I kind of describe my books as supernatural thrillers, but they're, they're definitely horror, but, but horror is such a broad genre. And yes. It means so many different things. And I think 
people who don't know horror genre fiction, they assume it's all Friday the 13th, it's all serial killers, it's all ghosts, it's all vampires. And it's yeah. it's, it's really an amazing breadth of content being created, especially today, um, in the horror genre. So I like to, I like to, when I'm hand communicating, personally, one-on-one -on -one communicating my books, I like to say they're like supernatural thrillers. They're not really body horror. They're not really splatterpunk. They're not really... Uh, weird, what we call weird fiction. They're not like obtuse, you know, genre or um, like gentle, you know, hand holding, uh, socially, socio politically correct fiction. It, these are like, these are like, you know, they're like haunted houses. They're like, you know, they're like roller coaster rides. So, um, so that's why I like to describe them that way. But yeah, it's really a thriller slash horror. It's actually kind of a, it's a crime novel and a horror novel kind of hiding as a together. supernatural force to be reckoned yeah. with. Yeah. Hold on a second, because I realized that your studio got dark. Let me. I got to kill the overhead lights just a little bit. I need to get it a little more mysterious. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's a little bit better. Yeah. I don't know. My. Yeah. Just dark and. I don't know why I did that. And I've got the evil possession red light above the uh, recording oh, nice. booth. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. just. That's. You think it's a tanning booth? It's actually my voiceover booth. But I just got this guy. This is the scariest thing I've got going. <laughs> I well, I did a podcast once like years ago, and they're like, "Your office doesn't look very scary." And I'm like, "Well, all right." So I hung, I hung him up there. That way, it's more thematically correct, I guess. Philip, do me a favor, pr pr play play along with me. Give me a voice for that skull right there. Just make oh, his guy? mouth move. Yeah, just give me a voice. So this guy, <clears throat> this guy came from Guatemala, uh -huh. and you can also actually see right above him is this really scary guy. So oh, yeah. this guy's a full-blown demon. And this guy's just happy to be here. So Make him talk. Know, just I, I don't know say what kind something. of voice he'd have. He'd be like, he'd be like mm -hmm. hey there, Charlie. <laughs> 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 Hello, David. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Where's my body? <laughs> there you go. Very good. I'm basically a part-time ventriloquist <laughs> in addition to being a writer and uh, well it was yeah. amazing because i didn't even see your mouth move that was no. that was well, that's the, the secret thing. <clears throat> that's the thing yeah oh, that's God. how that's how you know you're doing it right you just see that little tickle right a little bump bump right. in the throat right. that's how you know it's like you don't even know i'm talking right now hey there buddy you don't even know it's me like how does that happen magic <laughs> he's like, like hey there buddy voice. <laughs> yeah i'm a professional voice thrower oh god frankly. Frankly. All right. Well, yeah. I also found this out that you're a screenplay writer too. And I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, um, yeah, however, so, yeah. Oh, please. Yeah. There's a, uh, in your accolades, I'm going to let you tee it up, but you wrote a screenplay for a movie and I went to dig it out and I'm like, that's not horror at all. Uh, I beg to differ, David. Are you saying that Santa Paws two? The Santa Pups is not the most terrifying film you've ever seen. Is that? No, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm going to look. Oh for well, it. then see, you don't know. It's super scary, oh, man. Okay. I snuck it in is? some horror. I snuck in some horror. That's what's called uh, paying the bills. Uh, in 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 writer speak, that's yeah. called paying the bills. I actually wrote. God bless him. I actually wrote seven uh, talking dog movies uh, for Disney, and. Um, that was the only one I actually got a credit on because uh -huh. most they're all they're all work for hire, meaning you don't get a credit and we don't pay you very much. And um, but uh, that one they gave me credit on because they ended up using so much of my script and I created characters and they used the characters and I wrote a song. I wrote three songs actually. Um, when I turned in that script, I went into a studio and I recorded, wrote and recorded three songs for the movie. And they actually ended up using one of them in the film. So they, I think based on the fact that I'd created these so many, I, you know, they, I created these, a lot of characters for that movie. I named all the dogs. I wrote a song. I think they were like, okay, we'll give you a credit on this one. Yeah. And my Im immediate <clears throat> question was, is there a check attached? To that credit? <laughs> and they said, no, no. Um, but anyway, but yeah, it was good. It was good. To, it was good to do that. I, and, I, and I wrote a couple. I did write. A, I wrote a horror ghost mystery for Lifetime Television called "Girl Missing." That looked pretty moderately scary too. 
it's the scariest movie you can make for half a million dollars in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, <laughs> in the middle in of 1995, uh, was it? Or? No, 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 2015. 2015, sorry. Yeah, don't age me, David. <laughs> yeah, so 2015. And so, yeah, so I did, and I wrote a bunch more, but what's interesting about the screenplay thing is that I hate writing screenplays. I'm actually writing a screenplay right now <laughs> called Death My Old Friend, which was announced, so I can say it, it was in deadline and whatever. And that is a that's a, a, a movie I wrote, I'm writing based on one of my own short stories. So it's got a director, it's got a producer. I'm writing the screenplay. <clears throat> We're kind of in the last uh, round of changes, um, but it, it, it's not a, it's not a fun gig. It's um, I much prefer fiction writing because when you write fiction, you can do whatever you want. You're the boss. When you write screenplays, you're just a tool. You're you're a wrench. Um, yeah. you know, in, in the, in the toolbox and everybody else has really the control. Um, so I don't really like screenwriting, but it does pay pretty good comparatively to fiction writing. And, um, and, uh, yeah. And then, but what's also cool about screenwriting is I wrote a bunch of screenplays over the years. Um, and none of them were made obviously because screenplays don't get made. And, um, but now I'm using all of those screenplays as um, the storylines for my books and stories. Nice. So I'm, I'm recycling all those ideas, you know, ch- modernizing them, changing them a little bit. But it's it's still it's nice to have that kind of treasure trove of of content, um, you know, at hand if if needed. Which begs this question because I was looking at. Uh, let's see. So so that I'm clear, your Boys in the Valley was originally published last Halloween as a. Um, in a limited edition, but is being re-released next summer, 23, right? Yes. Okay. And before that, Gothic, which you showed us earlier, which I love that cover, released this month to another limited release, but is being re-released by a different new publisher in early February. Correct. Now that is cool. I'm very so, impressed that you, it's hard. There's a lot going on. Well, I, uh, I'm a researcher. Um right. Don't try this at home. But um, yeah. so I think it's what's cool about that is so you released, you found a publisher, some, you know, some guy took a gal, took a chance on you. You went, cool. Yeah, we're in and did a limited number. And then later came around and said, hey, I got a new guy, gal who wants to do it again, but bigger. Yeah. And they just do a bigger release. How does that work? Yeah. So it's when you're an, <clears throat> when you're an indie author, um, as I am, you, you take what's given. Um, and I think what happened, so I had, a, so I had written a few novels. I have an agent, my agent's out shopping all these novels and you know, you get to a point where you're like, okay, we've been shopping this book for a while now. Uh, majority of the publishers that we were hoping to, uh, uh, interest are, are have either passed or just don't, are responding. So then you get an offer from like a small press. And what they do is, so Earthling published Boys in the Valley to your point, October 2021. And he came to me and said, I love your work. I would love to publish one of your novels. And I said, and so I gave him one of the novels and that was Boys in the Valley. And what was interesting was um, he published the book. It was only 500 copies were made, um, but he did like all the reviews. So Publishers Weekly, and Library Journal reviewed it, and Booklist reviewed it, and it started getting really good word of mouth, even though it was only 500 copies, and the reviews were really strong, and then, um, and it sold out in a day, and then um, in February of this this year, um, uh, a, a, a reviewer named Sadie Hartman, who's known as Mother Horror in the horror world, she wrote a review of Boys in the Valley, put it on her Twitter account. The next day, Stephen King retweeted her review of my book and said, I'm going to buy it, was his tweet, with a picture of my book. Wow. Which, which is which is cool. Were there any copies of my book to purchase? Oh, shit. Which there were not. Oh. So I had, a, I had thousands of people, literally, Stephen King's got 6 million followers. Or I don't know what he's got now, but pre-Musk. And, um, and it exploded <laughs> and people were emailing and asking for the copies of the book and getting angry with me because I didn't have copies of the book to sell them. And we sent a copy of the book to Stephen King and he's reading the book now and we're hoping he's going to blurb the book. And then 
but what 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 came out of it was I literally got on the phone with my agent. I was skiing in Big Bear with my wife. We were on ski vacation. And I and I got on the phone with my agent. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, what do we do? Right. And she's like, well, let's pull back this other book that we were shopping and let's go out with this book because the iron is smoking hot. And sure. we sold it. I think we sold it in it was like it was like it was a it was like a week. Oh um, my god. Yeah, to to tour Macmillan slash tour Nightfire. And um and then we actually ended up doing a two book deal with them. Uh and so that now so now that's coming out in July of July eleventh, twenty twenty three. So yeah, so it's an interesting it's it's I'm a big look, I'm a big fan of um and I've kind of done this with my whole career in a way. I'm a big fan of the garage band promotion model. I like yeah. getting my work out there and yeah. I like even if it's in a small way, um, because I think it builds readership. It's just like a, when you're, you know, when you were a band and you had like your cassettes and you'd go to a nightclub and hand out all your cassettes or whatever. Right. And I think it's like, or you'd perform at like some nothing club downtown and you'd have your cassettes, by the way, kids are, um, what Spotify used to be. <laughs> so those who are, those who don't know. Um, and, and so I kind of think of it, my writing career is that way, which is I'm like alter, like a mother was my first chat book and that got me a little bit of traction and then i put yeah. alter out and that got me a lot of traction and that got me a story collection um offer and then i put the story collection out and that did really well and then you know i mean and it snowballed and now I, then i got an agent and now i have no, so now it's everything's now i'm with big five publishers and you know things are looking and i'm writing full time which i wasn't a year and a half ago so i think for me it's all about getting the work out there and you never know what's going to happen but you can't but, but if you don't put your work out there, nobody's going to read it for sure. That's I can guarantee you, right? So All right. things like Stephen uh, King tweeting are an extreme example, but it happens. All right, I want to I want to go down this rabbit hole for a little bit <clears throat> because um, we've had a lot of different people on the show. We've had agents on the show, publishers, etc. We've got Tom Colgan, who's a major editor in the uh, writing world. He's going to come up soon this month. And I've heard a lot of different ways to do it. Now, there are guys like me who's nobody in the writing world who s learned about self-publishing around 2004, 5, 6, 7, somewhere in there, and said, well, hey, I'm a renegade guy. I'm a filmmaker by you know nature. And so I'm like, I'm just going to learn how to do it and do it. Did it sell a lot? No. Did it get a big traction? No. But I did it. So here's my point. Sometimes I think it's great, you borrowing your phrase, the garage band approach. Stick it out there. If it sticks, great. If it doesn't, move on. Because if yeah. you're a writer, you're going to write every day anyway. So I banged out, what, <clears throat> eight or nine books now. They've all done mediocre. It doesn't matter because to me, the experience of writing the story was number two. Number one. Number two was publishing it myself and maybe designing the covers. But you never know where somebody's going to see it and pick it up. Now, I know there's a lot of people who will say, and actually uh, Gina Panettieri, I believe it was, said recently, she said, oh, if you're a self-publisher and you're putting books out and they're not doing super great and you come out with this thing that you really want to go after agents with <clears throat> and they look at you, uh, look at your book sales and they're not remarkable, she says, you got to be ready pretty much to have a pen name right there because uh, nobody's going to touch you. So I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, I don't a hundred percent agree with that. I think what I have found in I I talk to a lot of writers, obviously, and um, and I have like a podcast about writing. So I've I've, I've gone and that goes into the business of publishing very specifically. And I think the I think what she I think what she's what she's saying is if you if you sell a book to a a big five publisher uh -huh. and that book tanks. Mm -hmm. then you now you now have a track record with big five publishers i don't think big five publishers are going to look at um your self-published books and say oh that book that he put out or she put out by themselves with no marketing or promotion or publisher behind it only sold 900 copies so therefore this book that we just bought is only going to sell 900 copies. I don't think that's the way. I don't think, I, I think they're smarter than that. They realize it, it's apples and oranges, but were you to come out, like if Boys in the Valley comes out. So I, like, okay, so for example, I've got this book that's out right now, right? Child Alone with Strangers with Skyhorse, who's a middle, mid list size publisher. 
but not a big five publisher, but not a small indie publisher. And then I've got Gothic coming out with Cemetery Dance. Again, somewhat big, but not a big five press. They're kind of they're what's known as an indie press. I mean, even Skyhorse is known as an indie press. So those books are kind of going to be whatever they are. Mm-hmm. But but Boys in the Valley is coming out from Macmillan here in the United States, and it's coming out from Orbit, which is part of Hachette in the UK, in the UK Commonwealth countries, on July 11th, 2023. And if Boys in the Valley tanks, I'm in trouble. Because that's <laughs> because that is... Now, okay, now we've given you the platform, we've given you the marketing, we've given you the promotion, we've given you the worldwide distribution. Now that we need, to, you know, now you are now establishing a track record. So that's where I, that's what I think it, it's more about. It's more about, because if you sell it, because what you hear a lot from authors, what you hear a lot of authors say is, I sold a book to a big five press, that book tanked, and now no big five press will touch me. Right. That's, that's that is true. Um <laughs> But again, I, I think the I think the climate, I think I don't think you can look at anything traditionally and say that's how it is now in any in any industry. I mean, it's just things are changing so fast with yeah. technology and with the way things are, content is getting uh, disseminated and getting into people's homes and getting into you know readers' hands, as it were. I, it's just it's a everything's different now, and I don't really know what the models, but I do know that. It, I do know that if a publisher believes in a book, they're going to buy that book regardless. Yeah. And I think it's just a matter of, well, what are we going to, what are we going to pay you for the book? And what are we going to put behind the book from a marketing and promotion perspective? So, so I think those, all those things are affected, but I don't think it's quite like, I don't think there's anything scary about putting a book out or I I should say, I don't think you need to worry about track record when you're self-publishing a book, or even if you're publishing with an independent press, I don't think you need to worry about like, okay, now this is my track record. I don't think that's true. I think what it is, is when, you know, the other thing is once you get into that circle of big five publishers, you need to start really thinking about, uh, set, you know, how, what your sales look like and stuff like that. But a lot of that stuff is out of your control to a degree. <clears throat> but, you know, I feel like I've learned a lot about promotion, promoting all these with all doing all these indie books. And so now that I'll have all this other stuff, behind me marketing and promotion wise from the, from the prep, from the publisher. And I can continue to do what I already do, like build up my social media, all that kind of stuff. I feel like I'm in a good position to hopefully give the book a nice, a nice push off. All right. So two things pop in my mind. Number one is I'm a big fan of, if you want something, you just got to go after it. And you got, uh, as I said earlier, you just got to throw it against the wall and just keep going, learn from your mistakes and just keep going. What the yeah. big deal So you fail? What the hell? Who cares? Right. Number one, <clears throat> Now, number two is, and it's a it's a loaded question because you don't know, but I'd love to I'd love to dig down on your psyche as to what you think. Okay, uh, column A, uh, boys does magnificent, and you're off to the races. I got a pretty good idea what your future would look like. Column B is it tanks, as you said, heaven forbid. Um, then what what would happen, and or your strategy be to pull that out of the tailspin? Well, David, I'm a big drinker, <laughs> and I think what would happen <laughs> were, were the book to do well. I think, I think you're talking about this much drink, uh huh, in my near future. And with the book were to tank, I think you're think you're talking more like this much drink. This is a chart, a by the way. This isn't a glass. This is like a chart, like a flow chart. Um, uh, the uh, the 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 uh, you know, I'm in a weird position because I have a two book deal. So yeah. I have two. I have two shots at the. I have two shots at the tar, at the target, um, which is both good and also terrifying because I haven't written the second book yet. Ha ha. So the second book needs to be as good, if not better, than the than the first book, which is already um, not that one. Not this one. I'm just pulling no. this up. Oh for... yeah, I can actually show. Hold on, I'll show you. Yeah, because if you got props, Philip, please yeah, share. Yeah, I, pro- I have. Yeah. Oh, this is so. This is the original Boys in the Valley. This is, was published by Earthling Press in 2021, and the new cover will look nothing like this. But it will be a hardcover and an ebook and a audio book and a, everything else. Oh, uh, and that'll be <clears throat> Macmillan will put that out. But I think I think um, I don't really know what the numbers are. I haven't been in this new uh, realm of publishing long enough to know really the what the numbers need to look like. I, I, I have a slight idea. Um, 
but um, you know, I, I'm, I try not to worry about it. I, I think the thing is I'm very comfortable. Um, I'm very comfortable putting out books with, uh, with, with a variety of publishers. I've now, I've now published with, you know, very small presses. I've published with, uh, you know, deluxe, you know, uh, presses that make deluxe editions. I've published now with, you know, Skyhorse, moderately sized publishers. I'm going to be publishing with, with Macmillan and, and those guys. And so I, I think what it comes down to is if the books do well, yes, that will make my life easier in the sense of I will be able to sell future titles to them more easily. I think if the books don't do well, obviously it's the opposite, but I don't think it's ever a golden road. I think like I, for example, I have given, I've offered two other books that are completely finished, wrapped, done uh, to, you know, two different publishers that I, that I'm working with on these big releases and mm-hmm. they've all passed because they want to wait and see how boys in the Valley does. So uh-huh. I'm selling those. So I'm not waiting. I'm selling those books to other people, you know what right. I mean? Because I, I don't really, I don't, I kind of don't, I mean, I do care. I won't say I won't, I don't care, but because I'm my, to your point, my goal is to get my work out there. And right. so if these guys want to wait to see how uh, these books do before they commit to further books, that's fine. I totally get it, but I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to move, I'm going to move on and I'm going to try and sell these books to other, other, other publishers. So, so I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to keep writing, you know, I'll continue to write. I may have, you know, you know, I may have a few books that maybe don't sell to major presses. I'm, I'm, and, but then maybe I'll have another big mainstream the book that does. And I, I think you just kind of take it on a case by case basis. Um, you know, a Josh Mallerman's an interesting, uh, uh, case study in that Josh, uh, he wrote bird box. Right. And so he publishes with Del Rey. All his right. books are with Del Rey, but Del, there's, there's also books that Josh writes that Del Rey, um, and I don't want to put, I don't want to, from the outsider perspective, I don't know, I'm not putting any words in anyone's mouth or whatever, or saying I know it, anything inside baseball wise, but there are books that he puts out with small presses as well. So my assumption is that Del Rey is, you know, is not is not right for them. So for whatever reason. And so he's like, puts out books with Earthling who did, who did the Boys in the Valley. He's done a couple books with Earthling. Um, and uh, and he's, but he's also simultaneously doing books with, with Del Rey. So I kind of see myself being in that m- world where whoever will, wants the book, um, there you if go. They're gonna, if they're going to do a good job putting it mm-hmm. out and getting it out there, then I want to work with that person. If they're excited about yeah. the book, I want to work with that person. And, yeah. um, and so I kind of, that's the way I kind of operate. Um, because you know, you know, you look at, okay, smaller press, maybe a smaller press, and they may they don't have the marketing and promotion and distribution that a big five press has, but my royalties look a lot different with a small yeah. press. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of different rationales that go into it. Ultimately, right now I've got okay, so I've got so I got a book coming out from Zagava, it was a very small press in Germany. Um, that book's coming out in December called Don't Let Them Get You Down. I've got a children's book coming out from a publisher called Hybrid Sequence Media, who's a very, very small micro press. That yeah. came out. That's coming out in December. I've got Child, which came out from Skyhorse. I've got a Cemetery Dance Gothic book coming out, and then I've got the Big Five book coming out in July. And then in October, I've got another story collection coming out with Lethe Press, who's an indie, independent press that I've already worked with a couple of times because I like working with them. So, you know, so I, I'm I kind of diversify. It's sort of like a portfolio if you think about it that way. Sure, you know, that's exactly I'm not going to be crushed. <laughs> I mean, I will be crushed. <laughs> I'll cry for days if, um, if, <laughs> and you know, drink. if, if, right. And drink heavily. If these, these big five books don't do well, but at the same time, right. I'm very comfortable selling my books to other people. And I, and there are, and there's, there's, I have other ways to get my work out there. So, um, my plan is just to keep writing, uh, keep working really, really hard to promote every book, make the books the best that I possibly can make them try and find them good homes and go from there. You know what I mean? That's, that's kind of my MO. All right, we're 42 minutes into this tasty uh, interview. I want to take a short break. When we come back, I want to uh, cover two things. First of all, we're going to actually get into the book that we're talking about, A Child Alone with Strangers, with Philip Fricasi. And we're also going to talk about, uh, I don't do reviews on the show per se, but I got a couple of thoughts about it. So if you'd like to hear that and stay with us, it's a thriller zone. We'll be right back. The best thing. 
And now back to the show. David Temple here with Philip Fercasi, and we're talking about the book, A Child Alone with Strangers. And, and as I said before the break, um, and I actually referred to this earlier in the show, and I said, and I hadn't said it yet, that if you want to use this phrase on a future blurb, you know, David Temple from the Thriller Zone, you can say, and hear what it is. Philip, in my opinion, is the master of the slow burn. Hmm. Nice, right? Yeah. Here's why I say that. <clears throat> I'll probably just say you the pick- master. And then no, dot, 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 master. The okay, master. well, there you go, Ma- the master. When, when you pick up the book and you read the prologue, you think you're in for one ride, and you are, and it is terrifying. Then you flip and you get into chapter one, and it feels like a different world, but it peels away very quickly, and you realize, better buckle up, because this is going to be a hell of a ride. And it is for 575 pages, as you can see. But boy, yeah. is it worth the investment of time. There you have it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, man, I'm delighted. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that the prologue and the chapter, first chapter, are, to your point, dramatically different stories, right? And, um, and I did that on purpose because I wanted people to know <clears> – <throat> Look, this is a horror novel, and yeah. um, and I'm gonna let you know that right off the top, so there's no confusion. And um, and I also liked it as a tease, uh, because when you start with Henry's story in chapter one, and you're like, well, wait a minute, yeah, this just happened in the prologue. How right. in the world is this kid mm-hmm. ever gonna <laughs> be entangled with this terrifying? creature um is sort of like the hope of that is that you're going to stay with me um for for the for 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 the first few hundred pages while i get that all set up for you and then well that's why that pages are kind of like uh the downhill roller coaster drop yeah and it's that juxtaposition of two antithetical worlds that make that so intriguing. You know, you would think, oh, well, it'll start this way, but the second one is really close. But the fact that you start this way and then you go this way, and because it's a kid who was hurt, we'll just say only that, and I'm all in. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh. And then you're down this road and you're you're and you're not even thinking about it and you're just going along, going along, and then things get freaky and you're like, oh, okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a couple <clears throat> neat things. I think there's a couple um, interesting things about writing a book that size and keeping things fresh for the reader. Um, for example, for one is you got the character, you have to you have to be invested in the characters. That's yeah. the big number one. People have to love Henry. And I love, love Henry. And yeah. um, It's and, hard not think, to. Once you connect with Henry, I got you because now you're wait now you're now you want to know what happens to this kid, and um, and so writing him was such a a, a gift uh, that was given to me by the muse is uh, above and um and uh, but all, the other thing that I think that especially for folks who watch your 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 show w- would find interesting is I I introduce I think it's around I think it's around two hundred pages maybe around two fifty I'm not exactly sure. Where I introduced the FBI agent, it might have it might even be early it was Sally, right? And um, and I love that guy too. I love Sally, and um, he's a really interesting cat, right? He's pretty eccentric. So I like to think that I'm creating a lot of interesting people for you to invest your time in and invest your emotions in, and um, you know whether it be Uncle Dave and Aunt Mary, or Sally the <laughs> FBI agent, or Henry, or these criminals or mother and baby, whatever. I think there's, yeah. a, there's a lot, there's a, it's a pretty big cast. And um, and I was actually really fortunate because I was able to connect with a, um, a CIA agent who was willing to read uh, sections of the book to answer a million questions that I had. And I thank him in the back of the book. And, um, you know all that stuff that's in there about the hostage rescue team and the way things were and the way things operated in the 90s when it when it when a when a child would be taken like that um that's all you know pretty accurate um yeah 
I did obviously take some liberties, but for the most part, it's it's the way things would have gone down. And even I was like, this doesn't seem very real. <laughs> this doesn't <laughs> seem very realistic, but it's true. And the like the for example the um the the um the severity of the response from the FBI, you know, the the degree of the response where they're bringing in teams and planes and stuff, you know, it's um it's no joke. So and that's all that's all how things would have would have gone down. So I was really lucky to have that resource. And then Todd, of course, being the DE, uh, a and a and and um, agent, and you know he had some small input too. So when he because he read a very early manuscript, but it's a big book. And the thing with big books is, um, especially ones that have this kind of cast, and I'm kind of doing a lot of different things. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, is you it 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 is hard to get everything right. Timeline uh fact checking there's medical stuff there's legal stuff there's police procedural stuff um and then there's the stuff that i'm just making up right but it is it is it, so that was a it was a it was it was a hard book to write in that sense it took me and i worked really hard to make sure it was as accurate as it could be i talked to doctors i talked to lawyers i talked to the cia guy so i really you really try and get it all right and you ultimately you're not going to get everything right as I've already been told by some early readers, God bless them. But, um, yeah. but, uh, but, but it is an interesting, it is an interesting to go that big and that broad with a book because it's a fun challenge, but it's not a ch challenge I want to repeat often. Um, right. I, the, like this book takes place. It's a 90,000 90, word book, 300 yeah. pages. Um, this book is same, more traditional Gothic, more traditional size books. Um, more of one setting kind of thing, you know, smaller yeah. cast. Um, but I do, I have an idea for a big book I want to write. Um, probably not next year, but probably the year after that, where I'll, I have a pretty, a big idea that'll be kind of a broader, a broader cast and a lot and a kind of a bigger world. Well, this also begs this question because I know that you've done a lot of shorts, novellas, et cetera, a lot of articles, periodicals and so forth. And I, I, I wonder <laughs> I, it, with something this long, I, I want to ballpark, just because I'm curious, Kat, how long did it take ballpark start to finish for this? And, uh, you know, what, what made you go, okay, instead of these, we'll use the phrase, you know, 90,000, which is kind of standard, which is kind of a good amount of time to spend with a book. Um, you know, how did you say, I want to do epic versus standard? How long yeah. did it take and what made you do that? <clears throat> yeah, so it was definitely a conscious decision. So I had written, um, so come back with me, David, to 2017. Let's go, let's go back in time. And <laughs> yeah, woo, 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 woo. Um, <laughs> now we're in 2017. Um, oh, God. <laughs> so I had written a bunch of short fiction, to your point. I had written a lot of for short fiction. I, I, was, I was selling the short fiction. Everything was going great. I had, I, and I got an agent agent i call him agent number one and agent number one said um look you can keep writing dark short fiction and you can have a wonderful dark short fiction career and you can really continue to enjoy your day job or you can start writing novels and try and make this a career and um and i had already written three novels previously um that were not genre novels not horror novels uh, um in my 30s and uh and um so i said okay so i said i'm gonna write i'm gonna write a horror novel and i had never written a horror novel and i knew off the top that i said i really want this to be a big what i call a kitchen sink novel i want it to be big and fun and scary and and i want to do some world building i want to have i want to have it's mild spoilers folks so i want to have the telepathic kid i want to have the creature in the woods i want to have the haunted farmhouse i want to have all that stuff it's all i think it's all in the description right and um and i and i wanted to kind of write because you know i grew up on sorry, stephen king dean coons yeah. clive barker i loved those big crazy batshit you know horror novels and so i wanted to write yeah. a batshit kitchen sink horror novel that was sort of an homage in a way to all these great tropes that i had grown up reading so i really went in with that mindset of this is going to be a big crazy all-in 
novel. And um, and agent number one didn't want that novel, so we are no, you know, we 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 went different directions. Yeah, he Bye-bye. wanted me to write a fifty thousand word, you know, crime novel, and I said, no, 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 I want to write a big scary horror novel. So yeah, I got another agent, and then whatever. And now I have an, another agent, agent, and she's wonderful, and, and things are going well. And um, but it took a long time because. Because what happened was I started, I didn't, you know, I was really reliant on that first agent to tell me what to do uh, for the industry perspective. I really wanted to sell that novel, obviously. So I think I'd written the first 50,000 words and then I rewrote the first 50,000 words and then I wrote the outline, then I rewrote the outline. And then it was just like this kind of, kind of constant struggle where he was trying to get me to write a book I did not want to write. And so there was a lot of co- conflict and I was very depressed and I was very anxious because I was like, this is not the book I want to write. And I knew the book I wanted to write. It was so clear in my head. And um, so that was like a year is my point of that back and forth. What took you know, That was about a year of time. And then once I was freed of him, I was like, okay, I'm going to write th- – now I can go back and write the novel I want to write. So I went, literally went back to word one and did a made whole rewrite and just kept going and going. So that took me about another year, call it. So I wrote oh. the novel is 175,000 words, give or take. So, um, so that was like a year. And then it was a year of me trying to sell it. Okay. So that was a very also anxious time. And meanwhile, I'm writing on other novels and I'm writing short fiction and stuff like that. But um, ultimately I ended up going to Sky Horse. And then once we sold the Sky Horse kids, then there was a whole nother year of <laughs> editing, waiting for Sky Horse to, you know, get their act together. Sorry, Sky Horse. Um, and, um, and so that was like a long process. So, so all in, to answer your question, about three years of work to get this book. Whereas comparatively this book I wrote in four weeks boys in the valley yeah which is so it really in this book you wrote that in four weeks 90,000 in I wrote four the weeks first, I wrote the first draft in four weeks yeah got it yeah I think I and I probably spent another not really that much I spent maybe another couple months editing yeah. it not that much so this probably all in no more than three months yeah. um because it just was like there it just like it yeah. moved and i was done and it was it's you know it's it's a this it's a very isolated story the whole thing takes place in a in an orphanage in yeah. t- turn of the century pennsylvania so it's it's a pretty it's a pretty i mean but it's got a huge cast of characters there's like 30 plus characters in that book um and then this book interestingly i think it's interesting um this was originally a novella a forty-four thousand word novella and gothic I, in agent number two gothic thank you agent number two was like dude why do you, are you putting a forty-four thousand word novella into this story collection that we're trying to sell why don't you just expand that novella because she it was she felt it was very expandable and i and i agreed into a novel and we'll sell it as a novel and so that's what i did and um so I, every book is sort of unique you know and um and the book i'm writing uh starting to write right now uh which will be the second book in the Tor Nightfire deal that I have. Um, you know, I'll probably that'll be somewhere in the middle. It's probably gonna take me about three months to work it out. But I'm a big outliner. Yeah. I'm a huge outliner. So I usually spend a few weeks outlining and then I usually spend uh a couple months writing and then I spend a X amount of time editing and stuff like that for a tradition for a standard novel. Boys in the Valley was um a situation where uh, I had written a screen I'd written a screenplay. Uh, years ago and I kind of brought the screenplay back out and I wanted to kind of re and I, and I kind of, I completely rewrote that original story into more of a, what I thought would be a better format for novel. But yeah, once I actually started writing it only took, it took exactly four weeks. I actually was, was um, posting word counts on my Facebook page. Like, okay, week two, I'm at 32,000 words, whatever. And I wrote the, I wrote the last, I think it was like 12,000 words of that novel in one sitting which is, wow. which is wow. crazy, which is, yeah, it is crazy because it just was like, there wasn't anything stopping me. It was, you were in the I mean, flow. I was in the flow. And what's yeah. uh, interesting about writing uh, is that what a lot of people don't realize or think about is that writing is actually really exhausting. 
And oh, you're, yeah. tax, you're taxing your mind, which is in turn taxing your body because the two are connected, folks. Science. What? And, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Your mind and, is connected to your body? I don't want to get into it. It has to do with nerve endings or something. And um, <laughs> the spine that plays a part, I think. And, yeah, I think. Um, <laughs> but yeah, for like a week, I was totally wiped out, like wiped out, like dead to the world, um, birthing this horror baby. I'm going to interject something here. I'm going to find this research and I'm going to do it on a future show. I may even have to bring you back to talk about it. But I was, someone was asking me recently, oh, I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. What'd you do today? Work out, travel? No, I'm, I was working on some ideas for the story. Yeah. Wait, what? You, you're sitting around thinking of ideas? I'm like... And then I did a little tiny deep dive. The amount of calories that is burned up here with the gray matter stirring itself is much more than you'd ever imagine. It's way more taxing than people think. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this sounds like a defense, Philip. Exercise or whatever, because yeah. God forbid. But um, yeah, it is. <clears throat> and I and and when I finish a project, uh, when I finish like a novel or, a, or you know a big story, big project like that, it usually you go takes to Big me- Bear and ski. Yeah, I mean, it takes me a few days to recover, honestly. You need to reach. I mean, you see writers all the time talking about recharging their bed. And that's why I'm not a huge fan of the write every day mantra. I actually yeah. don't think that's the smartest thing to do. I, I get it if I, – I and I get it. If you're, if you're like, need to, that inspiration and you need to feel like, like you need that kind of structure where you have to write 200 or 500 or 1,000 words a day, I get that. But I'm more of a, I write when I'm writing and I don't write when I'm not writing. You know what I mean? It's it's kind of, that's just me. Let me get this straight. So when you are actually writing, that's when you write? That's when I'm writing. I don't look, the brain and the body, David, are, (laughs) I can't explain. Look, this isn't a science program. I can't get into like all the details. (laughs) You You wouldn't understand them anyway. We'd be here for days. Yeah. All but right. Yeah. I want to take, I want to go down a beat, uh, a side track for just a second, because as I was reading about you and getting to know you, uh, slightly as I was on social media, I thought, I want to ask Philip what his upbringing would like. So can we go down this path for just a couple of minutes? Cause I want to drill inside your head. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. We talked about the fly already. Yeah. No, no. Your, your childhood, you weren't a fly as a child, Philip. What was your, where, you know, where did you grow up and how many siblings did you have? Let's start there. Um, I grew up, I grew up outside Detroit, Michigan in a city called Southfield. I was, um, dude, you're not going to believe this. I was getting ready to say, was it Southfield by any chance? And the reason I say that is that's where I lived when I was doing a radio show that was based in Dearborn outside of Detroit. What? Did we go to I lived in no, Southfield, right outside of Twelve Mile Mall or something like that. Sure, Tell Twelve, the Tell Twelve Mall. Tell Twelve, and I dated a girl over. Mile. Oh, baby, a lot of partying going on there. Anyway, uh, sorry. So yeah, that's where I would go when I wasn't in, uh, supposed to be in school. I'd be at the Tell Twelve Mall playing video games. So yeah, so I grew up in uh, Southfield. Um, I left Southfield uh, when I was nineteen, and I moved to Chicago. Oh. I moved there with a band, so that was a smart play on me. So you always thinking, and um, that lasted about uh, I would say less than a year. Mm-hmm. And I got in some trouble. That's an off-camera story. Okay. And um, and and I knew a dude in here in Los Angeles who was a movie producer, and I said I would like to come to LA and work in the movies. Will you give me a job if I do that? And he said, Sure. So I moved to LA when I was 20 wow. and um, started working in movies and as a crew member, not as an actor. I know what you guys are right. thinking. Um, I mean, with and, that face, come on. <laughs> right. Yeah. Everyone wants to see this. And, um, and that was it. And so I stayed, I've been here for 30 years. Um, so let me back know. up a second. Where in, where in Chicago and don't tell me anywhere near diversity in Sheridan. I don't think so. I lived in Old Town. Okay. Um, okay. So, so uh, maybe uh, diversity of, was so d- d- diversity was uh, 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 you know near uh, Cubby's Field. <sighs> I What's the name of the road where I think Second City's? I think Second City was Sheridan. Oh, yeah. uh, LaSalle. 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 Right? I lived at like yeah. LaSalle and something. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You're down in Old Town. Yeah, I was up it was, in the. Yeah, I was it was down by like the lake. 
Yeah, yeah it was done by like Second City and Second um, City. Yeah, and uh, I'm just yeah, I was yeah, 19, yeah, and we had a yeah, I lived there with this <laughs> band, man, and uh, all these That's high school hilarious. kids. Yeah, I was their manager. I'm doing air quotes for that. I you know, yeah, I, I, would, I would go. I would go with them and drink and watch them perform. And I was their manager. Um, and every now and then I'd have to like strong arm a bar owner for, yeah. for, for, for money. If like the drummer took off halfway through the set, which actually <laughs> happened and they didn't want to pay us because the band was just basically jamming for half an hour. Um, so that was interesting. And yeah, I just, I, 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 uh, I tried school. Uh, I didn't care for it. Didn't gel with me. And, um, yeah. So didn't do that. Didn't do the school thing. Um, unfortunately, I kind of, in hindsight, I wish I had. And um, because it's really hard to get a job without a college degree, I've discovered. Yeah. See, kids, listen to Uncle Philip. I tell my kid, I'm like, I don't care what degree, I don't care what you get a degree in, but you're getting a degree. Um, because it's a pain in the ass if you don't. So yeah, yeah. and then in Chicago was was kind of fun. <clears throat> um, but yeah, and then but really my whole adult life, I've been in Los Angeles. Um, that's awesome yeah and growing up nothing really you know i mean i was an 80s kid you know we you know we got in trouble i did horrible things i, I was the youngest of to answer your question i was the youngest of six wow kids. um so by the time i came around it was just like look dude, your parents are like ah what the fuck? don't die just, and don't go to jail yeah and, you know we'll see you and we'll see ya. and you almost died and went to jail so i mean you just really Correct. made your parents proud didn't you Correct. And, you know, it was one of those things where, um, yeah, it was such a weird time in hind looking back as things are now, you yeah. know, we were those kids that were like, you came home when you came home. Sure. Yeah, I would go away. I mean, I would go, I think about it now. I'm like, that's crazy that they like, yeah. was able to, like, I would leave for like days and I didn't have cell phone. I didn't, I wasn't, you know, sending postcards. Like, I would come, you know, and I would just come back like a couple of days later and, see what was in the fridge. So it was pretty, yeah. it was pretty loose. I worked, I did work hard. I, my father owned a, um, my father owned a, like a, a, a grocery, what's called a party store. Yeah. In Midwest parlance. I was a sort of a, a grocery slash liquor and booze and so stuff like that. So I worked yeah. there from when I was like 12 years old till I left it when I was 19. So I, I did work a lot, but, um, but yeah, so it was kind of just like, but otherwise I pretty much did whatever I wanted to do. Pretty normal um, upbringing. Yeah, I think ish, so. I think ish, for that yeah. for that time, I think it was pretty standard. I think for that yeah. time, and especially in the Midwest, um, but now it's totally. I mean, here in LA, my kid growing up, you know, I raised a kid here in LA. It's yeah, no, he's carries a gun. The leash is short. <laughs> you know, there is not a. Uh, <laughs> we'll see in a few days, buddy. No, it's a. Uh, no, it's be careful out there. It's a yeah. All right. So let me bring it forward now. Uh, and, and here's to today's, how deep do you see yourself going? In other words, have you reached the depth of darkness that you think you can travel? And we're talking about horror thrillers. So I'm, you know, you've got a pretty good handle on darkness. Do you say to yourself, do you wake up some days and go, you know what? I think I've got a little more darkness inside of me. Um, no, the answer is no, I have not reached the bottom, as it were. Uh, I have so, but the thing with me is, I'm actually, I write what I want to write. So, um, I wrote a children's book, I wrote a book of poetry. Um, I, I might, uh, one, I have two books that are being shopped right now. One is a science fiction novel, uh, one is a straight thriller, um, with some supernatural elements, but neither one of them are horror. Um, but then I have horror novels coming out. Boys in the Valley is horror. Gothic is horror. So I kind of write what I want to write, which kind of goes back to our publisher conversation a little bit. Um, because there are some publishers who won't publish, like Nightfire, who's been wonderful night, and I hope to work with them a lot. Um, they they only publish horror, you know. So my science fiction novel is not necessarily a good fit for them. But But as far as horror is concerned, no, there are some ideas that I have for future stories and future novels um, that are, that are very, very, very dark. And I, I love exploring. There's two things about horror that I like amongst a million other things. But the one thing is I love that horror allows you to do anything you want. Science yes. fiction, there's parameters, fantasy, there are parameters. Um, you know, 
non-genre crime fiction, thriller yeah whatever there's always a little bit of a box right horror Romance. is kind of like anything goes. free for all yeah yeah it's a free for all and i really love the freedom of that and i love kind of being able to take a story wherever i want to take it and um and i really love that and the other thing i like about horror is i like that you can write characters the way people really are i like yeah. writing dark characters not because they're not because they're unusually dark, but because they're real. And they and they and I used to get criticism for that early on in my work, which is like, I didn't really like this main character. They were mean. And it's like, yeah, they were mean because that's how some some people are very mean. Yeah. Not, and not everybody is nice, you guys. I hate to burst the bubble. And even nice people have dark sides. And even dark, you know, people have lights bright sides and i think and i think so like for in child alone with strangers for example the criminals are pretty nuanced you know you you, as you've read the book there's there's some history to them that's not necessarily that gives them a little bit of depth that (laughs) makes they're not you know they're not two-dimensional bad guys um and the good guys have a little bit of you know like um like goodness to them henry's father you know, yeah. he's got, he's a very complex character. So yeah. I really like the idea that I can write real characters um, yeah. when I write horror. And I, so to answer your question, tying it back to your original question, I love the idea of writing characters that are very complex and very dark and who go into, go places that people don't necessarily think they want to read about, but I think ultimately yep. I'm hoping that they do. I actually, this book I wrote called, don't let them get you down, which is not a horror novel. It's it's not a genre novel. It's but it's a it's a novel about depression. Um and um and that's a very, very, very dark book. And that's that's coming out in December um on a from a small press called Zagava. And um but I really I really enjoyed um enjoyed might not be the right word, but I really found a lot of fulfillment writing about this character and his perspective because it's very real and it's very real what people go through when they go through like depression ring or they struggle with anxiety or whatever it is so but i I try also to be entertaining i think the number one rule with any form of media whether it's a movie or a book is you have to entertain the audience and so i try to do that first number one but then also I, i like exploring some of the darker corners of um of the human psyche for sure so i definitely have some depths i have yet to travel all right. Well, I want to ask this question because it's it, we kind of touched on it earlier. We we're talking about your name versus a pen name and uh, whether this is successful or that successful. But back to having a variety of publishers. If you're going to write <clears throat> straight ahead thriller or horror, we'll say, you know that there are certain publishers that specifically uh, excel at that. So if you want to write, to borrow your suggestion, uh, a poetry book, then you would just simply keep your name, yet go with a different publisher, right? So you don't see, so the, the business, the business, corporate business doesn't care what the name is, as long as the book that you're pitching, that publisher that excels in that genre feels like it'll be, be a success for that publisher, right? Correct. Got it. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not a I'm not a fan of the pseudonym. Um, there's a writer named um, Craig Davidson who uh, has written some wonderful novels, um, and as Craig Davidson, and he's written some horror novels as Nick Cutter, um, all of which were our bestsellers. Like The Troop, uh, you know, was a, was a huge novel. Stephen King blurb blurb and the whole thing but he he was told by his agent to and, and i know this because i listened to a podcast he did to change his name for the horror novels and keep his real name for the and he said i didn't want to do it i fought against it but ultimately um listened to my agent and he said i regret it every day and i'm the kind of guy who wants my name on my book so yeah. <clears throat> i think another example and this i could see myself doing this uh, is a, there's a wonderful writer named Brian Evanson, who has won every award there is. Uh, uh, guys, a Guggenheim Fellowship, you know, oh, Henry Award. Wonderful writer, good guy, good friend of mine. And he writes, um, he writes a very uh, literary, um, 
vein of horror. Um, and um, primarily short stories, but he's got a few novels as well. But he also writes um, a lot of like um, tie-in movie stuff. So he wrote like an Aliens novel. He wrote uh, a horror novel based on a horror movie with Rob Zombie, for example. And um, and when he writes those books, he goes under B.K. Evanson instead of Brian Evanson. So he basically, he's differentiating his name probably for readers so that they know like this is not my usual Brian Evanson book, um, but it's still his name. So I could sort of see maybe doing that if a publisher wanted me to not use my name, I could maybe do like, okay, well we can do my initials and my, something like that. But I would, but no, but for the most part, I like just, yeah, it's my book. I wrote it. Why yeah. I just you have my name on it. I mean, yeah. I don't think, and I also think I was talking to my editor at Nightfire and we were doing what's called the ad card for the, for boys in the Valley, which is basically you're listing all of your other work. And, right. um, and I was like, I want all my work on there. I don't just want my horror novels on there. And, um, and she was like, yeah, that's great. And she was like, uh, she said, a lot more authors are beginning to do that, are beginning to say, like, this is my body of work, not all of which is a direct, you know, tie into what you're reading as far as like genre or whatever. Um, and I think it's just so I think it's opening up, loosening up a little bit. I think I know a, I know a guy named uh, John Mantooth, who's a wonderful thriller writer. He And he wrote a book, uh, a couple uh, thrillers under the pseudonym Hank Early for crooked lane. And, um, because, because the publisher, because his story collection to kind of circle back to our, our very early conversation, um, didn't do perform well. Um, and so they wanted to give him a, they wanted them to use a pseudonym. And he wrote this, a uh, long blog post recently, okay, about, maybe it was in the last year talking about that decision and how he regrets it. And, um, so it's, it's, it's weird. It's kind of, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a delicate thing, but I will never say never because money talks, but if, um, and I got, I got bills to pay, but, um, I think yeah. for the most part from a, from a psychological uh, point standpoint, uh, and from a personal standpoint, I would always want my, my name to be on one of my books. Um, but to, and to your, to, and to your point, whether that's with publisher A, B or, or C, yeah. um, yeah. And okay, well that that answers some questions for me, and I appreciate it. All right, now we're as we start to wrap up. There's a we're going to do a little thing at the end, which is just good fun, and you're going to be perfect for this. It's called rapid fire questions. If you listen to the show, I love rapid fire push. questions. Thank you. <laughs> it's my favorite part of every episode. <laughs> all right, then you know because you're such a fan, you know that my closing question is always the same for all authors and you're going to give a splendid answer to this. If you were to offer an upcoming writer the best piece of writing advice, what would it be and why? Or just what would it be? Let's do that. Don't do it. Um no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding you guys. I'm joking. Um um, my writing advice would be to, to be my, my writing advice would be to be yourself and to, um, to write in your voice, to write what you want to write using your own writing voice. Because I think what people, readers want more than, look, there's no such thing as an original story. We all know that. <clears throat> but right. I think what people, what, what, what draws people to certain, what draws certain readers to certain writers is they connect with that writer's voice. And, and if you use your if you use your voice, your unique way of telling a story, you will find readers who connect with you. I think if you try and um, mimic other voices or try and chase trends or try and write something that you're not comfortable with writing, I think you're going to find yourself failing more often than not. I would say just, you know, believe in yourself, believe in your voice, write from your heart, and you will find you will find an audience and it may take a long time to build that audience. But if you keep at it and you keep working, um, eventually, you know, I think you can, you can build an audience and you will find people who connect with you. Nicely done. Very good. All right. Well then, since you listened to the show, you know what that sounder means? It means it's time for a drink. <laughs> this is... <laughs> It's scotch time here at the Thriller Zone. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't think this is ice water, do you? All well, right. That's nothing but pure vodka. I know that. You, I know see, that. thank you. There's, this cup is full of scotch. <laughs> scotch, 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 scotch. All right. 
Well, writing, which one do you like to do? Write in private silence or public chaos? Silence, private. Got it. Do you stream soundtracks or tunes while writing? Okay, so that's going to negate the first one because you just like flat out silence. Okay. I no, no, no. No, I like sound. No, I, I meant by silence, I meant I don't like people talking to Got me. Got it. You uh, like no. to be in a... Uh, 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 soundtracks and or music that does not have uh, lyrics. Words. I can't, I can't have it. words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. I love it. All right. Now, still in the music idea, especially since you, you were with a band, and I said with, air quotes, a band, do you, uh, if you're road tripping, say to a writing getaway, what's on the music player of choice? What I'm would driving? you be listening to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you? Yeah, you know, you're gonna you're gonna head I, up out to a lake. You're gonna go up to Big Bear. I and you're just, just gonna... got back from a writing retreat, so I'm gonna say I was listening to um, I was listening to a lot of rock and roll. Okay, okay. anybody specific? A genre? Year? Uh... I listen to a lot of um, like uh, uh, like Green Day and Weezer okay. and stuff like Weezer. that. Like, nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty, yeah. I'm like pop rock, alternative okay. rock. Yacht rock, you said? <laughs> yacht rock. What Are you familiar yacht? with yacht rock? No, is that rock you listen to while you're on your yacht? Yeah. No, what's if yacht you listen rock? To, if you listen to XM uh, Sirius Satellite, Yacht Rock Radio, they have a, they, they just play all the Kenny Loggins and, you oh, know, Tears yacht. for Fears, Yacht. Hey. Yacht Rock Radio. All yeah, the yuppies, like electric, yeah. No, I'm more like Electric Light Orchestra. Uh, yeah. you know, Green. I'm like classic rock, I guess. There you go, classic. Okay. Pretty right. Now, I know you're not an actor publicly anyway, but if Children Alone were picked up as a film, say by Jason Bloom of Bloomhouse Productions, one of my favorite producers of all, what role would you like to play inside this delicious book? And Me? I know, yes, come on, oh. step up. Be real with me, Philip. I, by the way, I'll tell you, I have a Jason Blum story that I can tell you sometime. <clears throat> he almost uh, if you me. answer this, if you answer this question, we, you can tell me immediately thereafter. The answer to your question is I would like to be the gas station attendant who, um, <laughs> no, I take that back in the story. There's a bum who is a key player in the story. He, he, he's the one who, um, he he uh, he makes it. He he has an important plot point, and he's a bum at a gas station. So I would want to be the gas station bum. Okay. Now everyone's got to read this book in order to find out what Philip would play. All right. Yeah. And finally, this is number five. After you wrap at Artifacts Bookstore there on Coast Highway, coming up on December tenth at three o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern or Pacific time. You're invited to join uh, Tammy and I for dinner and a podcast at our house. Now, here's the little thing I want to throw at you. All you have to do is invite one or two people to round out the uh, group around the dinner table. Who would they be and why? You can Anybody in the world. It could be living or, or past. Just I want to find out who you'd like to sit down and talk to for a couple hours, just like we've been doing here today and enjoying every second oh, of it. Man, this is such a lame answer. But I would love to have some one-on-one -on -one time with Stephen King. I would love to pick his brain on writing. I would love to learn some of his tricks. I have so many questions for him as to his writing and how he does the things that he does. Um, and so I would like Steve to be there, Uncle Steve. Um, Why is that lame? That's not lame at all, Philip. That's not like lame. Sort of lame. No. And then... You mean because everyone else says that? Is that why? Because it seems like an obvious. Like I wish I want to say something more like non-obvious, but that would be. You want to say I'm something always... like Mark Twain or something? Oh no! <laughs> I don't want to hang out with Mark Twain. Okay, I don't I just, think. Just... I don't think. Maybe I would. Maybe he's funny. I don't know. Oh. Um, yeah, I guess it'd be fun if Uncle Steve was there. Okay, um, and one more just to mix it up to maybe go right. down a beaten path, to, to create, a non-beaten like, path. A non-beaten path. Contrast. Yeah. Um, man, that's hard. Well, uh, I that's why I get I'm paid the big bucks. Fan, I'm not a huge fan of people. Um, you don't seem that way to me. Oh, uh, thank you. I know you would never know I'm agoraphobic by by never leave this room. This is my bed oh. right over here on the cot. Um, uh, 
Oh, I know. I, I, yeah. Um, okay. I would like to Barry, uh, Barry Sanders. I would like Barry. Like okay. Barry. Barry Sanders was go. a uh, the greatest running back of all time for the Detroit Lions from yeah. uh, 1989 to 1999, for those who may not know, um, and should Let's be the all-time rushing leader, except that Emmitt Smith ran for 17 seasons or something like that, and Barry only ran for nine. Oh, but look what they accomplished. All right, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. once again, this is a book you're you're going to want to add to your library, A Child Alone with Strangers. Philip Fricasi has been our guest, and... Um, I do want to say, if you'd like to learn more, go to pfricasi.com, or you can follow him at Philip Fricasi at Twitter. Uh, and you, you're digging on, you you have good times on the social media there, don't you, son? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm on board with social media. Um, it's a good, it's a great way to connect with readers, and I enjoy connecting with readers. I really do. I love hearing from readers. Um, it's such a pleasure for me. It's such an honor for me for that people read my books and buy my books. It's like I'm constantly blown away by that fact. So, uh, yeah, so I like being on social media because I like I like readers uh, reaching out to me and I like inter interacting with them. And there's like a there's like a Fracassi fan group on Facebook um, that's been a lot of fun to be part of that these guys created. And there's like 400 people in there and I give them exclusives and uh, you know, insider information and stuff like that. So it's, 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 it's fun. I'm a, I'm a, I like, I like chatting with folks about, about writing and about books and stuff like that. So I'm a fan. I want to ask you this, or do you know anything about artifacts bookstore? So we're going to put this plug in here one more time down on yeah. coast highway. Have you ever been there before? No, I have not ever been there before. Um, but Greg, uh, uh, posted about my books just one day randomly. And, um, and I reached out to him and asked him if he wanted some book plates and we got talking and I said, dude, I should just come there. I'm, I'm in LA. I should just come down and do a signing. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm excited to be, I know that it's, um, I know that it's new and used. It right? is new and used and it's probably the tiniest bookstore I think I've ever been in. Yeah. Which is really kind of cool. Cause it's intimate. I mean, it's not like, uh, you know, it's not a big box store. Um, right. it's, it's not like Warwick's, which is one of my sponsors, which is a big, beautiful, delightful, gorgeous bookstore there in La Jolla, California. Oh, really? Um, okay. yeah, but you would, you'd love to stop by there, but I will see you on the 10th. It's Saturday around three in the afternoon. Tammy and I are going to walk down and say hi. Great. And, and if you don't have any plans afterwards, there's a great, you're a craft beer guy, aren't you? Yeah. Right around the corner, within steps, there's a great craft beer. There's uh, tacos. Everything. We're gonna we're gonna have some fun if, if you in. got the time. Yeah. Yeah, I've got the time. Yeah, I'm not driving two hours to do it and come turn around and come back. You know, I'm gonna hang yeah. out. Yeah. Hi. Um, well, this has been a ton of fun. I'm so glad that we our paths crossed. Thank you to Todd Scott who teed this up. And again, you know, the book is the Shot Alone with Strangers. And thank you, dude. This has been good. Thank you, David. I, re I really appreciate it. I'll say this about Child Alone with Strangers and about Gothic. Um, for folks who like signed books, this is me. This is the international symbol for signed. Um, right. Also for check. <laughs> right, right. No, that's, uh, you can go higher. This is check yeah. and this is signed. Um, okay. Unless you're being subtle, like you don't want, you're, you want to impress, you're just kind of like right. to the waiter. Like, it, it, um, what was I saying? Oh, vjbooks.com vjbooks.com which is a family owned online bookseller uh, they sell uh, all of my books they sell signed editions of all of my books so if you want to order um any of my books and you want a signed copy you can buy them from there because i know some people some folks like the signed the signed books so vjbooks.com has signed copies awesome. of my stuff yeah. is there anything that i did not ask you that you wanted to cover that you meant man i sure wish david had asked me that anything at all that just pops into mind you don't have to dig deep on it no because we no, covered a lot. I think we covered a lot. Yeah. I mean, we could have talked about my music industry experience. We could talk <laughs> about my bookstore that I own for eight years here in Venice Beach. We could have talked about, we could have talked about the time I, I, I did a scene with on camera with Christopher Walken. Oh. I could, could have talked about that. I could have talked about my, I could have talked about my Jason Blum story. Well, um, I do. Is, just, is, you know what? The, next time. Next all time. Right. Is the Jason Blum something I need to do off camera? Probably. Yes. <laughs> okay. So is this, we'll, we'll because it's, not a, it's not a happy, it's not a happy story, All but right, he's, well, he's great. I love Blumhouse. Go watch. Yeah. yeah. Huge fan. All right. We'll, uh, we'll have that conversation here in a second, but we'll say goodbye to 
all the international shows that are streaming us right now. Hello, Brazil. Love you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really, I really appreciate it. And and um and I'll thank Todd as well. All right. All right, brother. Thanks again to Philip for a splendid time and not all that scary either. All right. Next Monday, our last bonus episode of the year. I'm very honored to welcome who I like to call the editor to the stars. He's edited so many books by some of the biggest, most prolific authors in the business. You don't want to miss this episode. Tom Colgan is our guest. I am positive you're going to walk away with huge takeaways. Before I scoot out of here, I want to say thank you to my sponsors, AuthorBytes.com and Warwicks.com. AuthorBytes is offering all authors who would like to have their personalized website built using the code The Thriller Zone, three months free with a one year contract. And for my friends of Warwicks.com, if you love beautiful bookstores like the one in La Jolla, you're going to love Warwicks.com. Now, if you can't make it to the store, go to their website, warwicks.com. So thank you so much for your support. And of course, as always, you can give us support easily by simply providing a review, a short, tiny little blurb wherever you get your podcast. Take 30 seconds to say, hey, David, thumbs up. We love your show. I'm listening in so-and-so. Just drop us a note. Five-star reviews, always very, very helpful. And of course, you can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash The Thriller Zone, where our subscribers are growing by the week. Please subscribe. All right, I've got some reading to do. You do too. I'm David Temple, your host. I'll see you next time for another exciting edition of The Thriller Zone.